I'm honoured to be here today to talk to everybody um, about what is a common problem that is causing a lot of distress to both patients and physicians. Um, this was meant to be a guidelines talk and I really have had a look at the guidelines. I think they're completely unhelpful. So you're going to get my opinion here and you're going to get the opinions of my colleagues because I've canvassed a lot, of, um, a lot of other people's opinions to try and give us a little bit of a consensus. So anyway, I don't have the magic answer, but I can share your pain. Um, COVID I was involved in acutely. We saw a lot of the acute phase COVID. We know that there was all this cytokine storm, but what no one really worried about was that recovery phase that can go on for many, many months. And that's what I think we're all dealing with now. A couple of points. The cough that people get after COVID doesn't seem to be related to the severity of their illness. Up to a third of patients after COVID can get this prolonged cough, which lasts for more than two months. And if you think it's happening more in COVID, it's because it is in the normal environment. About 2 to 18% of patients would get a post-viral cough. So COVID's doing something a little bit different to our patients. Concerningly, 2% um, of patients are still coughing after a year. What causes a post-COVID cough? Look, it, it, it depends. Omicron causes a lot of upper airways problems. There are a lot of these patients getting post-nasal drip and sinus symptoms. There are still some patients where they've got a cough related to their lower respiratory tract infection. That cough is serving a purpose. It's serving to clear away debris down there. There's another group of patients where they've got nerve sensitization in their pharynx and their larynx and their hypopharynx. This group of patients, the cough is no longer serving a purpose. Um, in fact, the cough becomes the problem. It's the same thing. The more someone coughs, the more they will cough. And there's a small group of patients um, who we continue to follow who do have like an interstitial lung disease pattern post severe COVID. A really important thing is don't label all long, all long COVID coughs as long COVID. This is just an incredibly distressing disease for, or I suppose diagnosis for patients. The moment they Google it, I can guarantee they're going to start feeling worse. So not all coughs that are prolonged are long COVID. And yes, yeah, so basically the other concern is that it then diverts your attention away from treating other possible treatable causes because we all know there is no treatment for long COVID. Don't forget about, and this is along that same line, don't forget about treating all the usual causes of cough. Common things are still common. We're still seeing a lot of um, cough variant asthma, a lot of wheezy bronchitis. These sort of patients um, will have elevated eosinophil counts and that classical um, um, exacerbations and wheeziness. Don't forget reflux. Up to 70% of patients who present with a cough, and some studies have been found to have reflux. And for a lot of those patients, it's silent reflux. So you do have to think about it. As I mentioned before, a lot of these patients have post-nasal drip symptoms. They're clearing their throat. They can actually often um, feel secretions coming down the back of the throat, or you could see it. And then there's this iatrogenic cough, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel block is often implicated. I've just put these here just to remind you of all the other conditions that we see. Bronchiectasis has really high prevalence in our community. Don't forget the usual um, smoking-related chronic bronchitis, lung cancer is still a red flag. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, another condition where there's a high prevalence, up to a third of those patients can also present with a cough, probably related to the gastroesophageal reflux that they're experiencing at night due to increased abdominal pressures. And I'll mention a little bit more about this laryngeal hyper-responsiveness in a minute. Now the World Allergy Association came up, they sat down a couple of years ago, came up with an algorithm to work out how to manage chronic cough. Now I don't know about you, um, but if you're busy and you're pressed by Otovic, this algorithm is not going to help you in any way. So I'll give you my own. It's really simple. Take your history. You often get your diagnosis in the history. Um, that history then helps you choose the right investigations and in turn the right management to at least start. There's not much to be gained from examination, but you can often pick up patients who have a breathing pattern disorder on examination. I think it's really important to be aware of that and look for it. And then your investigations. Do a full blood count. Look at that eosinophil count. Check if you're worried about allergies. Check your allergies, um, skin testing or aspergillus serology. Always do a chest x-ray. You'd be surprised sometimes what you can find and it will allow you to sleep better at night. Um, check for pulmonary function tests if you have access to them and if you're worried about um, eosinophilic um, inflammation, get an um, exhaled nitric oxide level. Um, obviously further imaging in the way of uh, CT chest scans and sinuses are more available in the hospital setting. And don't forget to do um, impedance or pH esophageal monitoring if you've got a patient who you think has reflux who has not responded in the usual way to their treatment. In general, in theory we should all be treating one thing at a time sequentially. 
Honestly, when you've got a patient who's distressed, who's been coughing for months, I honestly treat as much as I can as soon as I can and then start to back titrate on your treatment. Often trial your treatment for at least four to six weeks. So often I'm seeing people and they say, well, look, I tried that and Miprazole for a couple of days. It didn't help. You've really got to enforce to patients that it takes a long time to undo the damage and they really do have to stick with it. And um, share the pain with your colleagues. Involve your multidisciplinary team, your physiotherapist, your speech and language therapist, and as respiratory physicians, we are more than happy to help. So what are my management tricks? Um, if somebody's got asthma, I try to avoid dry powder inhalers. It causes them to cough, they then expel the medications. We use MDI in spaces if somebody's got a really bad cough. If they're refluxing, I treat them quite aggressively. We add in domperidone, and don't forget the lifestyle measures, the, the propping the bed upright, the avoiding large meals, the precipitating foods. Again, with post-nasal drip, I often treat with both antihistamines and nasal steroids at the same time. And of course, if you've got iatrogenic cough, stop the medications and then be patient. Sometimes it can take at least four to six weeks for things to resolve. If you've got bronchiectasis, physiotherapy and chest clearance is the key. It's, I always say to patients, the antibiotics are the icing on the cake. What you're really doing is you're, the antibiotics may clean the sputum, but it's the, it's the physio and the chest clearance that's actually going to um, clear their phlegm. Chronic bronchitis, and it's really a case of prevention there. And obstructive sleep apnea, if you can get a sleep study, go on and get, investigate that. So what is this about this laryngeal hypersensitivity? I think this is what's causing a lot of the coughs that we're seeing. It's, it's become increasingly recognised, um, but not any easier to treat. These sort of patients, they present with a cough that is well in excess of whatever they may be producing. It's chronic, it's dry. They often describe this really stereotypical tickle in the back of their throat, this raspiness, this dryness that they've got there, that then is proceeding, immediately proceeding um, a cough. And it may be just a quick cough, or some patients end up with long, long bouts of coughing. It can be triggered by a lot of things, so be it movement and cold air and eating, anything like that, which can, I think, make it very difficult to diagnose because you're thinking if somebody gets the cough when they're exercising, oh gosh, it must be asthma. If it's after meals, it must be reflux. For a lot of these people, it's just this general sensitization. It doesn't take much, and these people are coughing. It often comes after this viral infection. And that's why, of course, we're seeing it after COVID. So this, well, how do we treat it? Um, again, it's usually a combination of treatments. So I often involve my physiotherapy colleagues really early with breathing retraining, speech and language therapists, again, trying to work on relaxing the upper larynx and some of that um, increased tone that a lot of these patients have. Um, we start amitriptyline or nortriptyline. It doesn't seem to matter which one, and up titrate that dose. It's usually limited more by um, drowsiness that patients experience would be the reason why they can't continue to take that medication. For some patients, we're now starting them on gabapentin, and again, it's just a case of starting low and slowly up titrating that dose. Codeine helps some patients, as do a number of other um, medications, but there is no real consensus right now. The important thing here is you've got to treat the triggering cause. You can't just treat the hypersensitivity. So when you start your gabapentin, don't stop your omeprazole, don't stop your nasal steroids. And the reason for that is because if you have an ongoing stimulus um, for that cough, for that laryngeal hypersensitivity, your treatment will fail unless you're actually also treating that. The other one is just don't forget about breathing pattern disorders. These patients come in with a shopping list of symptoms that don't seem to fit any physical findings that you've got. Um, the important thing is you often don't see them hyperventilating. These are not the pa patients where you reach for the paper bag. But you'll notice that they're sighing. They do not like wearing their masks. They have chest wall tenderness. And um, they just have these multiple complaints that do not fit. We've seen an epidemic of breathing pattern disorders after um, the COVID pandemic. And there is this really clear um, sort of confusing um, mix between what's the pathophysiology, what's the psychology, and what's the biomechanics. For a lot of these patients, it was triggered by the in in initial infection, and then what happens is that their apical breathing pattern becomes their breathing pattern of choice going forward. So you get into this real vicious circle. Patients who are hyperventilating, they're breathing in cold, turbulent air, that then triggers their sensitized laryngeal nerves, it triggers their cough, and as I said, the more they cough, the more sensitization it is. 
So just in conclusion, the thing is, this is common. So we are all um, seeing this diagnosis. Don't label it as long COVID. Treat, um, look for the usual things and treat them. Don't forget breathing pattern disorders and try and get onto those early if you can. And you continue to treat all the other causes. And the other thing is patience is required here. And just who would you investigate? Now, I'm very aware that this depends on which DHB we are, whatever we call them, we are actually working within. But certainly from in my perspective, um, we are happy to see patients where you're needing further imaging, when they've got other complicating conditions. We're happy to see patients with breathing pattern disorders who require a physiotherapy input. And we're also happy to see patients who have got this laryngeal hypersensitivity where your first line treatments have not actually helped. Um, we're also happy in my service to actually see patients who you believe have long COVID um, who you feel would benefit from a multidisciplinary approach.